Hello there, and welcome to Success as a Student, a skills podcast for students and anyone who wants to develop key skills that will help them in being successful. My name is Alexander Wood. I create online skills content for the University of Derby. Outside of work, I am a trustee, a chairperson of a youth group, and the University of Derby Graduate of the Year. In this series, we focus on how you can develop skills that will help you to succeed in your university study, your career, and in your personal development, all by interviewing experienced University of Derby staff and successful students. In today's episode, we're discussing how you can find and use your voice whilst at university. To help me with this, I'm interviewing the wonderful recent graduate, Scarlett Moss. Scarlett was a fantastic student at the university and used her voice to make changes, which resulted in her being awarded Academic Representative of the Year in 2017. In 2018, Scarlett was elected by students as the Vice President of Education and ran successful campaigns for the university about having an opinion, value for money, and for a 24 7 library. So, hello, Scarlett, and welcome to the Success as a Student podcast. Would you like to just introduce yourself for anyone who's listening today? Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, my name's Scarlett Moss. I guess I can tell you a little bit about me. So I used to study at the university a couple of years ago. And yeah, I really, really enjoyed my time at university. I went on to be elected as a sabbatical officer of the Student Union, which I'm sure I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And I now currently work in a full-time staff role in a student union uh, in Birmingham. That's a little bit about me, but I'm sure Alex will want to delve into that a little bit more throughout this uh, throughout this session. Yeah, we'll definitely be talking about your experiences as a student, especially in terms of finding your voice. Both of us were program reps at the same time, and then you went into the Union of Students to, uh, after being elected as the Vice President of Education. And we worked on a number of projects there, and one of those projects that you worked on was all about having an opinion. And that is essentially the key and the core of this episode is about how students can, first of all, find an opinion, but then also how they can use that opinion to make positive change. And the first part of that is about having a voice. And so what I'd like to know about first in this episode is about how when you started university, how did you find your voice, Scarlett? I think that's quite an interesting question, actually. And I think the first thing to do to kind of make sense of that is to look back just before I started university. So um, when I went to college, I initially wanted to, one of the A-level subjects that I wanted to do was psychology. And I had a bit of trouble in my GCSEs um, with getting my math. So I needed a B in maths, but I was currently at a C level um, and I needed the, the B to get to college. But it wasn't until a couple of weeks after I'd started college that actually my school contacted me and said that I had actually had a remark and I had actually achieved a B, but I'd already bought all of the textbooks and resources for the other course, which I'd chosen, which was sociology. And that's consequently what I went on to do at university. So I was joint honours student. So I majored in sociology and I minored in education studies. And the reason why I'm mentioning this, I think, is because if I reflect on kind of how I've kind of found my voice, how I've developed as a person, I would say studying sociology, particularly for me, was one of the biggest ways that I think I found my voice. Um, for those people who might not know, who are listening kind of about sociology, it's very much about thinking about how different people act, why they act the way they do, um, but kind of opposite to psychology, it's more about kind of in a social environment. So you look at lots of different theories, um, but for me, it was really useful to think about putting myself into other people's shoes and really thinking about you know, how, why, you know, why do other people feel the way they do? And can I, as a person, empathize with that person to try and think about why they might feel a certain way? So I feel like as a person, I've always been, I think, quite empathetic um, and quite that way inclined. But I think studying sociology kind of built on that for me, because like you say, throughout my lectures, I was learning about different people's perspectives and, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed, you know, learning about different things and having debate and discussion with people and trying to kind of widen my my worldview, I guess, of, of why things are the way they are. So I would say that's one key thing for me that personally helped me to not just find my voice, but also to try and understand other people's voices, I guess, and how they act and feel and, you know, why they do things a certain way. 
So that's really interesting for a few reasons. Um, the first thing that I want to just uh, mention is that um, you chose a subject that you're passionate about, but you found by accident, which is actually the same way that I found law, because I had a, a mishap happen to me that made me accidentally study law where I didn't mean to. And those type of things, sometimes you think they happen for a reason. Uh, and it's interesting to see someone else who's had that happen to them as well. Um, but on the second front, uh, choosing a subject that you're passionate about, really useful for that. But also, if you didn't study sociology, we'll talk about different ways that you can find your voice as well. But uh, part of part of how you found your voice within sociology, you, you said about how you thought into other people's shoes and you studied a subject where you had an opinion about and you were able to learn and develop that opinion. So at university then did you continue to build and find your voice just in sociology or did you get involved in any extra quick opportunities to help build your voice yeah so um I think yeah sociology was kind of the first step I guess I took towards finding my voice but I kind of came into university or maybe developed whilst at university this mindset of take every opportunity that's thrown at you I think is one of the best things I've probably ever done. Um, so kind of a couple of months, I think it was into my first year, I remember the conversation came up around, we need a course rep or we need a couple of course reps who wants to do it. And um, this is no reflection on student unions because as I say, I've worked in a couple now, but you see it a lot sometimes across universities. You go in and you say, we need a course rep. And people are like, mm, I don't really want to be that. Um, so I would, I would say, if I'm being honest, initially I put my hand up because no one else really wanted to do it. And I think I was maybe somewhat seen as the person in my class who kind of participated and, you know, asked questions and spoke to different people. So I thought, do you know what? I think I get on with people enough in this class. I think, you know, I'm vocal enough to to take this role on really so I remember putting my hand up and my lecturer at the time looked quite relieved I think because <laughs> it had been about five minutes um whilst he was just kind of like staring at everyone like come on someone needs to do it um so I would say that's probably like kind of one of the second uh steps that I took specifically in university towards um finding my voice or you know using my voice to try and create positive change yeah, you were very involved in the program representative scheme later, and we'll talk about that again later into this podcast. But um, I just reflected on how you said in your course, as in quite a few different courses, no one was interested in becoming the program rep to start with. It's interesting to hear that because in my course, it was the exact opposite. So I actually was slightly interested in doing it, but um, at the at, in my first year, there was, I think, 10 people stood for it. And I sat there and thought about myself and thought, I, I can't. I won't possibly win that election. I shouldn't go for it. These people are far more experienced than me. They're older than me. They'll know what they're doing far more than me. And it was only when they actually had stood up and went and talked through their election speeches that I think, maybe I should have gone for this. And it was too late at that point. I'd missed my opportunity. And then it was only the next year that I actually got involved because a lot of the things that the programme said they would do, they didn't do. And so I came and said I'll do it because I knew that I could be honest and, and would want to help people in the ways that they said they would and then they didn't. So that's why I got involved. And it's interesting to reflect that against your experience. But initially, I didn't go for it out of a lack of confidence. And that was one of the big barriers that I had to overcome. So thinking about barriers, Scarlett, in terms of barriers for you finding your voice, were there any barriers that were in the way? I think that's an interesting question. Um... I think one thing, similarly to you, Alex, um, has always been confidence. I think sometimes I think I portray this kind of outwardly um, very excited, very, um, you know, outward focusing persona that I'm very confident and I can talk to anybody and, you know, I'm very sure of myself and what I want to do and where I want to go. But yeah, the reality of the situation is actually often quite different. Um, I, it's only till very recently that I feel like I've actually started to get a grasp of kind of who, who I am, if that makes sense, and mm. kind of what I am passionate about and feeling a bit more confident that, you know, what I think and what I believe is, you know, or does have some value. So I would say, yeah, confidence can be a real big one. And whilst I've got better at, at some types of things, for example, 
um, standing up in front of people, doing presentations, simply because I've had, you know, years of experience of doing that now. In reality, there are still some things that people might think I'm good at or that maybe I look like I'm confident at and enjoying, but actually inside, you know, I'm, I'm shaking like a leaf. I'm not sure that I'm the right person for the job. And these are still things that I think a lot of people have to, have to battle with on a, on a day-to-day basis. Um, hmm. You know, I've, I've got experience of standing up in front of hundreds of people at open days, but what a lot of people wouldn't have seen at those open days was on my hands, behind my hands, I used to hold my hands kind of crossed over each other in front of me I used to write notes on the palms of my hands because I was so scared of not saying the right thing or forgetting what to say so there's there's often a a lot behind the persona that people put on you know in reality they're actually quite nervous and anxious of you know why me why am I good enough to be here definitely and something that I definitely felt that as well but just thinking about when I first met you uh, my first experiences recently before I actually started to get to know you the first time I met you I was at an event table for five people very nervous myself it was the program representative conference I think you were in your third year I was in my second year and you came over to our table introduced yourself and got us all to add you on Facebook got us all into a Facebook group I don't remember how that Facebook group went or anything but I just remember that you came across confidently and talked to us all and engaged us all and almost everyone's attention went from each other to you because of how confident you seemed uh, the next time I saw you, you were campaigning for an election, going around the university, promoting yourself and what you do to everyone that you could find, uh, and and you ended up winning that election. So to me, you seem like this massively confident person, and it's something that we've discussed in this podcast a few times already, but it's massively important to know that just because someone appears confident and someone looks successful, it doesn't mean that they don't have the same barriers that you do. It's about how you overcome those barriers. And something you mentioned earlier, Scarlett, is you take those opportunities and despite your confidence, you must have something and do something to get you to take those opportunities. So when you're lacking confidence, how are you able to actually take these opportunities despite that? I think one thing for me is, again, when it comes to kind of throw yourself into things that you're not comfortable with or things that you think you should try, is just giving it a go. Some advice that my kind of dad always says and I don't know how appropriate or not this is but he always says no one dies that's what he says to me Mm. and what what he means by that is if you go into a a speech in a room for example and you say the wrong thing or you go for an interview and you don't get it it always sticks in my mind he's always like yeah but no one died in the sense that you know nothing actually terrible terribly went wrong similarly for example the worst thing they can do is say no Um, And I think that's something that I try my best to kind of think about and embody when I'm going into different situations. Another thing, actually, when it coming back to the open day thing I was talking about, uh, a lady called Judith Lammy, who used to work at the organisation, but she doesn't anymore. um, She was doing the staff part of the, the speech at the open day before we as the student union representatives came in. And... I remember saying to her like openly because we got on quite well I was like you know I'm really nervous I don't know what I'm saying I hate doing stuff like this you know this is not what I want to be doing and she said another thing which sticks with me is that for example if you write a script down on paper of a speech that you're going to say whilst in your head if you if you miss a bit you think oh the world's ending I didn't say that bit actually what you need to remember is say all those hundred people in the room those people didn't have a clue what you were going to say. So if you miss a small part out, actually, if you miss a large part out and, you know, improvise instead, the reality is that those people didn't know that you changed or messed up or however you want to see it. So, yeah, kind of thinking of yourself as worthy, I think, is very important. And as I say, it's only recently that that kind of mindset has started to develop. And I think that's because, Um, I've kind of started to surround myself with more people and accounts on Instagram and these types of things that actually build me up rather than make me feel a bit, you know, obnoxious or, you know, not not part of the group. So Mm. I think, yeah, I think remembering you're worthy, remembering all the skills that you do have and throwing yourself into something. And you know what, if it doesn't go well, like again, coming back to the open day talks, I thought to myself, do you know what? If I really, really do really badly at this, 
I'm probably never going to see half of these people again. So mm-hmm. that's why, you know, it almost doesn't matter. So that those would be kind of a couple of things that I think have helped me somewhat. Yeah, I think it's always really important. And that's some really good advice to say about, think about what the the consequences are if something goes wrong. And often those consequences are things you put on yourself um, and they're self-applied pressure. And so in terms of confidence, that's something that you can easily get over once you start thinking logically about it, as Oliver Stoney has said in the Enterprise episode earlier in the series. And yeah, so I think that's some really good advice um, for you, Scarlett, about overcoming your barrier of confidence. And I definitely agree that it's something that I try to do is just throw myself at situations to get over my barrier. So we talked a lot about in terms of finding your voice, in terms of academic representation and representing others. But you don't always have to be involved as an academic rep to make change. And that's definitely the case. You can make change all over by getting involved with lots of different things and even just being on your course and giving feedback to someone. So Scarlett, what advice do you have for making change happen? Okay. Um, I think there are a few different things to this, but let's let's take it from the perspective of, like you say, if someone's not a course rep, someone's kind of very disengaged in a way with kind of extracurricular things because that's that's one of the the the, the first ways I would think of is you know reaching out to to what exists and what I would say there is actually um outside of the student union um so one one reflection that I have for example like like Alex has mentioned I was a course rep I went on to be a part-time officer then I was elected as vice president education so you would you would term me as a very engaged student but um what I would say is there are lots of other opportunities out there that you should seek. And again, so I, as Alex mentioned, I'm in the very early stages of setting up my own business, but what I didn't know because I didn't kind of ask the questions and didn't look around was that actually these types of services were also provided at Derby. So um, maybe I wasn't ready for that step. You know, when I was a student to look at setting up a business, I didn't know about things such as, the enterprise department and how they could help me to set up a business and those types of things. So I guess what I'm trying to say there is even if you aren't an engaged student, you know, even if you aren't a course rep or things like that, don't let that be a barrier to reaching out because from a student union perspective, they're always looking for more engaged students. They're always looking for more course reps or more sports team members or just people who have different ideas. That's why the student union exists. You know, it's led by students. But talking more widely out of that scope, if you never ask, you'll never know. And I know that's a very cliche thing to say, but it's so true. Linking to what I, some of the things I talked about in my Have an Opinion campaign, Value for Money, it's a huge thing for students, you know, you pay a lot of money a year to just do kind of your degree. Mm -hmm. There are so many other services, there are so many other opportunities out there that are available, um, which I would fully encourage you to just do. So like have a click around on the university website, ask your lecturer, you know, um, just, just throw yourself into different things. But I do realize that some of you might not feel, you know, 100% comfortable or, or confident with that. So I guess reflecting internally, one of the first steps that I would maybe suggest would be kind of thinking about what you are passionate about, because that's the first step, I would say. So, you know, thinking about what are my personality traits, you know, what what drives me, what motivates me? If I was to change one thing about the world or, you know, go smaller scale, the university environment, for example, what would be the first thing that I would look to change? And then you can start to add a bit more weight to it. So you could think, okay, so maybe I want to change this, but how do I do that? And then you can start, you know, if you're, if you're serious about it, thinking about actions that you can take towards that. So um, I don't know, say if you wanted to change a particular space on the university campus, it's thinking, okay, so who's the first person I can talk to about my idea? Um, or who are the different groups of people? Because you might talk to students, you might talk to staff, you might talk to people in estates who look after the spaces. So what I'm trying to say there is just, it's really about thinking about what your motivators are and what you're passionate about, because that will also help you long-term when you're looking for a job. Personally, I think, yeah, money's a great thing, but I think it's very important to enjoy your time 
at work uh, as well. So thinking about what you enjoy, what you're passionate about um, can be useful to help you to make positive change, but also to help you to realize kind of who you are as a person and, and what motivates you and drives you. I'll give you an example, actually, of some really good, uh, of a really good initiative that's that's been formed by students at the university through their desire to make change who aren't involved as a course representative, for example, and that's the Hedger Friendly Campus Scheme, uh, which is a group of students who've come about and said, we want to make the university safer for hedgehogs. And they've gone about making changes for that. They've worked with uh, staff, they've worked with other students, and they've managed to make the, they've managed to make actual changes and they've actually managed to make the university accredited with an award as well uh, and that all came about because students said actually we want to change they found out about they found out about an initiative that's going on around the UK and they said okay how can we bring this to derby and other universities have had the same thing happen and it's all about someone finding something they're passionate about and getting others involved and often it comes down to very small decisions yeah yeah so yeah um i would say universities are one of perhaps if not the best that i've come across so far one of the best places that will help you to do that like whether it is like alex said for example making a change on campus or maybe you want to take that idea a little bit bigger so it could be as a course rep it could be actually that you have something you're particularly passionate about that you want to make into a business or you know you want to set up a charity or all of these things are things that the university will help you with because let's face it it reflects really really well on them so mm. why would they not help you to bring about this positive change and i'm not going to say the road to change is easy um for example uh when i was a sabbatical officer what what i used to claim one of my biggest wins was was getting the first 24 hour library um in existence and again, this was perhaps my younger naivety. I remember officers saying to me, what's the biggest thing that you were proud of when you, when you were a sabbatical officer? And I used to say, 24-hour library. But actually, I was very lucky to have been kind of sort of in the right place at the right time. There were two of my previous uh, sabbatical officers in the same role, so for a couple of years before, who had been fighting for a 24-hour library for those two or three years. So it, it's wrong for me as an individual to take the credit for that because whilst I did contribute to it somewhat, um, I have to thank the other people that came before me to help me to get there. So what I'm saying is there is that often it, it will take hard work um, to affect change. Sometimes people will say no to you. And I think you have to, ref again, reflect on that. So thinking about, you know, is this a concrete no because they physically can't do it at the moment? Or is this a no because they don't know how important this is? And there are all these different types of uh, opinions and, you know, sides that you need to think about because there are lots of times, again, you know, when I was a sabbatical officer that we were told no, but actually once we'd gone away, done the research and, you know, I don't know, written a paper and presented it, the university would have actually gone, oh, do you know what, actually... You've actually proved that there is a real need for this. A prime example being uh, Abby, who used to be the, the president, she wanted to introduce anonymous marking. Now, I know there's a lot of controversy around the, the anonymous marking, but she did some big research with students and the, the research proved that more students wanted it than didn't want it. And it wasn't it wasn't easy and it, it took a while for her to get there. So don't don't let that you know, that that time period or that no or whatever, change your views. You might have to change your idea, but if you're still passionate about something, keep fighting for it. Keep, keep you know, plodding on basically till you get to where you want to be. The word I'd use is persevere. Uh, keep going through the challenge and often the, the things that are challenges are the things that give you the best rewards. I think um, a lot of the change that you were talking about there is big change. And a lot of the times, if you do get a no, then the thing I would always say is, as you just said, um, is to find out why they said no, um, to work out why the no is and see if there's scope then to try and persuade them and work out what the next step is. But if you don't ask those things, then you can't tailor the solution to make them happen in the future. And I think just to build off that, that's talking about resilience. That's talking about being able to take 
rejection or a no or even a I don't know maybe a yes but maybe a no you know different things that people present you with and knowing how to deal with it and again don't feel pressured if you're listening to this and thinking do you know what I'm not a very resilient person because it's it's again something that comes with practice you you know say if you get given a no a few times I've been to a few interviews now and I've been interviewed and it's been a no and initially at the start I remember thinking oh I'm so gutted like I must be dreadful I must have been the worst person they spoke to today but actually now in the context of interviews I think to myself I take the feedback on what the people have said to me and then I think to myself just because I was given a no does not mean I was the worst candidate out of the of the people there it just means that there was one person potentially that was better than me. And you have to take all of that on. And I think it really helps you to grow as a person. And, you know, coming back to finding and developing your voice, I think you have to go through the difficult times and people rejecting you and people saying no for you to maybe really hone in on what it is you want or what it is that drives you to get you to where you want to go. Not, not to be, you know, stereotypical but people always quote people like uh Jeff Bezos from Amazon and people like that and the, the chances are you know people have been rejected tens of if not hundreds of times you know before they actually someone sees the potential in them so well JK Rowling for example is Melanie Pope discussed earlier on the series when we were talking about growth mindset and our genius is born or made she mentioned that JK Rowling was rejected a lot of times with the Harry Potter book before she got published does that mean Harry Potter's yeah. bad? Exactly. It's a great, it's a great um, example. And these are all things that, you know, you will develop and don't feel pressurized to have all the answers now. I know it can feel quite scary. So when you leave university, you do feel the pressure of, right, I need to get a job. I want to get a good paid job. Maybe I want to get a job in the degree that I've done. But Sometimes things will go slightly off the rails and things aren't always necessarily straight from A to B. They might go A and then up and then down and then wiggly. And then you might get to, you might get to C. You might not even get to B where you thought you wanted to go. So I know this is very kind of deep, but this, this is what I would say in terms of, you know, when we're talking about positive change, finding your voice, um, reflect on what you want to do, where you want to go. And think about putting actions into place to get you there. And if things change, which they will do, you have to just adapt to it and, um, you know, utilize the people around you, the networks around you to, to keep pushing on for that thing that you want to get or you want to do. Adaptability is definitely a, a useful skill and a skill that someone who's successful will often tend to have. And a lot of that adaptability you just said there became because of you've got the network built up. And the reason why you probably have a network built up is because you've taken opportunities, you've gone out, you've helped people, you've made a positive change and impacted on other people in ways that they're thankful for and will therefore be happy to help you in return, uh, especially when it gets tough. So that's one another, another reason why helping people and getting involved with making change can be very useful. So, Scott, I have one other question about making change. Earlier, you mentioned how you used to claim that the 24-hour library was your biggest success. So, if you had to now reevaluate this and think about what the biggest change you made was, or at least the most important change that you made to you was, what would it be? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Um, I think one thing that's important to remember is that not all changes have to be big changes. Um, there's quite a lot of value in, rather than perhaps aiming for one big change, looking at small little changes that you can make throughout what you're doing. So thinking about that, one example is um, I started, and I've noticed that it's continued happening, doing the first blind book sale on campus so the, uni the university library used to do like book sales where they had donations and then people used to buy them and the money used to go into charity, I think. But I remember kind of finding this little idea and it's something I'm quite proud of, um, whereby you had the book donations, but actually you wrap them up instead and you put a couple of bullet points on the front of the book 
um, that gives a little bit of insight into what the book is like or, you know, if it's action, if it's thriller. And it was just a little idea that I had kind of around raising awareness of the 24 hour library because I had some flyers created and I thought it'd be a good way to do it. And actually, it was really successful. We received almost too many donations. I remember the little office in the union being full of books and everyone was like, why are there so many books in here? And I was like, I promise I will get rid of them at some point. And the shelves were full of them. And we came together as an officer team to wrap these books and it took ages. And I remember going out into the stall and the the stall was planned to be there most of the day. And I think we sold out within the first couple of hours and we made like hundreds of, of pounds of money for charity whilst also raising awareness for the library, one of my points. And I did it consequently because it was so well received, did another one uh, later on in the year. And I remember looking back probably about six months to a year ago, there was a society who must have seen the idea, who did it themselves and again raised money from their society. So if we're reflecting on small changes and things that I'm proud of, that would probably be one of the things that I am proud of that, you know, I would say it was a positive win, you know, a positive change because raise some money for charity, used an idea that I'd seen kind of done elsewhere, but it had never been done before. Um, and it was really successful. And consequently, people have obviously noticed that it's a good way to raise money because they're still doing it. And I think that also was a win for me personally, to some extent, because I really enjoyed that and I'd never really done fundraising before and it helped me to realize that actually that was something that I really enjoyed so I guess it was a win for the charity a win for my manifesto but also a win for me because it it was something I was passionate about that I'd never tried so that yeah thinking about small wins you know as well as big ones and it, it could even be like just changing someone's day if you smile at someone or say you know how's your day going that in itself is might feel small to you but it might be a big change to that person I always say that when you work in an organization and I still do this to this day it's important to make connections with everyone I would probably say that at Derby I was somewhat closer to some of the bus drivers than I was to some you know of the other staff and it, it's give and take, you know, um, I, I was nice to them because I genuinely got on with them. They were lovely. And I guess for me in return, if they saw me run into the bus stop and I was a little bit late for uni, they'd stop and they'd wait for me. So, yeah, think about the relationships you can create as well. And don't don't go in with this mindset of, well, if I do something for them, they have to do something for me. But actually, if you if you're just positive and nice and approachable, what you will notice is that the rewards start to come without even you wanting them. Definitely. I think that's really good advice. Um, so Scarlett, speaking of advice, there's one question I always ask at the end of all these interviews. And that question is, what advice do you have for being successful as a student? I think, to be honest, it would summarise kind of all of the things I think I've mentioned today. So the first point would really be seize as many different opportunities that are available as possible. Scare yourself, do things that make you feel nervous and anxious. Um, It might sound on this podcast like I was a very engaged student, but actually my engagement grew the longer I got into my degree. So I would say I was the most engaged in my third year. One example was that I really wanted to try badminton never really done it before I asked my flatmates none of them wanted to do it and I was like oh am I going to let that stop me but I really want to go and it probably sounds small to some people it might be big to others I remember just taking myself down to the sports hall on my own and just giving it a go and I was surprised how many people were like really receptive to that you know again I went over I was chatty I um, put myself out of my comfort zone somewhat and actually reaped the rewards for it. So first tip there, yeah, really try and engage with as many different things as possible. And if you don't like it, that's fine. And that that's almost more of a lesson learned because you know, okay, I've ticked that off the list. What else can I try? Coming back to what we mentioned earlier, you know, being open to others will get you so, so far. So not just being open to opportunities, but seeing the value that other people can bring and also 
self-reflecting and realizing the value that you can bring as a person don't let that confidence hold you back because you will always be asking the what if question what if I'd gone to badminton and I you know what if I hated it okay well I go home no one dies and I tried it and it wasn't for me so yeah just 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 be open to things be open to people you know try your best to see things from other people's points of view because I think it makes you a much more whole person just essentially to sum up what I've been saying the whole podcast really make the most of what's around you throw yourself into things that scare you um, but also still remember your own value and your own voice is just as important as anyone else's as well would be kind of my my summary I guess of the things I've uh, discussed today in terms of advice well thank you very much Scarlett you've given lots of advice been very honest so thank you very much for uh, helping with the podcast today and also for all the your inspirational advice that you've given no, oh, thank you, Alex. It's been really fun. I've really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed discussing with Scarlett about how she became someone who used her voice to make positive change at the university. And I was really surprised to hear that Scarlett, just like me, isn't as confident internally as she appears externally. And this leads to the first key point from the episode. When finding your voice, you need to identify what your barriers are and reflect on what you can do to overcome them. Scarlett mentioned that her dad gave her the advice of no one dies, which, whilst quite blunt, it is true for while she's studying at university, as you act in an academic bubble where you can make mistakes and you can fail on your journey to find success. The second key point from this episode is to try and find what you're passionate about. If you aren't sure, then you can always try something new and see how it goes and reflect on it from there. The third and final key point that I've picked out from this episode is that there is lots of support for ideas and change at the university. The Union of Students have an ideas forum where students can propose ideas and get other students to vote for or against it if they like it or not. There is also support for creating a business and also creating other opportunities for yourself within the careers department. You may be able to get support with ideas from lecturers and tutors who are always keen to hear feedback and make positive changes to help you as a student. In the description of the podcast, I've added some links for all the different areas that could help you with using your voice and implementing new ideas and change. Thanks again to Scarlett for sharing all of her insight and wisdom about how she found her voice. I really appreciated it. This episode was brought to you by the University of Derby Skills Team. Production, episode planning and editing was completed by Alexander Wood. Thanks to Stephen Plant for creating the amazing graphics and for balancing the audio and to Lily Kent for transcribing the series. Thanks also go to Natalia Kodalavar and Naomi Bowers-Joseph for giving feedback and helping in the planning of the episodes. Thank you very much for listening.